He's a good God. Amen. And he has a great church. Someone said, well, I like God, but I don't like this church. Well, that's not how it works. I say that all the time. You say, well, I like you, but I ain't going to like your wife. Then you don't like me. It's a package deal. As a matter of fact, I'd rather have you talking bad about me than talking bad about her. You got to be careful how you talk about a man's bride. Ooh, you can get in trouble talking about a man's woman. Mm -hmm. Y'all didn't know I could do ninja karate kicks, but I can. 1 John chapter 5 and 7, and uh, we want to keep the Oswald family in our prayer. Brother Jay Oswald passed yesterday, and uh, his funeral will be Saturday, Clay Bar Funeral Home. Uh, but incredible family, incredible uh, man of God, and we are so blessed that he was part of our church, and him and uh, Sister Oswald. And what a great, great shoes and large shoes we have to fill now. As the legends and men and women of God go on to their reward, amen, with each passing of these great, great men and women of God, it leaves a little more weight on our shoulders to carry on this great truth, and uh, what an awesome responsibility, and I know we're committed to doing just that, amen. Tonight's Bible, look at your neighbor, say it's Bible study, so uh, we, uh, Bible says you perish when you don't know, you got to learn, Amen. And so oftentimes when we know, when we learn, uh, that's where power comes from. So I want to know what we believe tonight. We're going to study a little bit. First John 5 and 7, there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. You can be seated. I'm going to talk to you about the history of the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, the history on the doctrine of the Trinity. I don't typically preach or teach against things. It is, I believe that you know the truth and the truth shall set you free. To know a lie, the best uh, way to know a lie is to know the truth. However, the Bible does say that we are to mark them in things that cause people, ideas that cause division. And when we do, um, what would you like to have taught? question opportunities through uh, the internet without fail at the top of the list it'll be something in regards or relations to the doctrine of the trinity now there is not any individual in the history of the world that you could hand a bible to with z that has had uh, zero teaching instruction that is just joe blow knows nothing you hand them a bible at the age of 30 say read this cover to cover at the conclusion of it that they will say there are three gods inevitably they will come out with the understanding of monotheistic theology that there is a single God. Hero Israel, the Lord, our God, is one. So we have to realize that that's what the scripture teaches, but the, the Christianity in which we uh, live has in some ways been perverted with false doctrines and teachings. Of them at foremost is the doctrine, false teaching of the Trinity. It's not something we debate, and it's really not even something we preach, for we are to preach Christ and him crucified. We're to preach the gospel of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. To debate the Trinity with someone who has not been filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, been baptized in Jesus' name is a futile. It's not going to work. It's like trying to find your keys in your house with the, the lights off. You've got to have the Holy Ghost in fire, and then you can understand. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto, me, but my, unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Amen? So, um, but I do want us to look at it. And tonight, so that you can have an assurance and a confidence because of this, uh, sometimes you have to unlearn a bad habit so that you can get to where you need to go. And because of past, uh, perhaps, teachings, you are, have been instructed incorrectly. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit. First thing I did is I made my own little video. Uh, we're going to dim the lights. And I, I did this all by myself, so I don't know if it's going to work. But, you know, I'm old. Dim them all the way dark. Get, and where were you when the lights went off? Here's my video. I did a search, blueletterbible.org. Uh, you can go there. It's a good Bible study uh, webpage. It's free. With most versions of the Bible, you have concordances. And I look, I go for Trinity. There are no concordance results for Trinity in the King James Version. I put in triune. And I, hit it, I, hit, I had to hit enter twice. Look, there. There are no results for triune in the King James Version. Leave the lights off. Okay? 
Now I said, well, let's look in the NIV version for Trinity. So I looked in the Trinity for NIV, and there are no results in the Trinity of the Trinity in the New International Version. I put in triune, and once again in the New International Version, I found that there are no results. So I looked in the English Standard Version. Maybe it's there in the Trinity. And even in the English Standard Version, which is a good translation, there are no results for Trinity. So I said, I'll look for triune in the ES. There it is, not there either in the triune. So I thought, well, let's continue. Let's go back to the KJV, King James Version, which is the most, uh, we, we know the best translation. Let's look for the t term eternal son. Eternal son, also not in the King James Version. So let's do another search. Let's look for God the Son, also not in the King James Version. None of these sayings, words that you perhaps you can turn the light back on, have heard and become familiar with are anywhere in the Bible. And yet, we have colleges, Christian colleges, we have churches, we have uh, Christian hospitals that have been named after Trinity. Um, so the only logical next question that you should have at this point is, well, if it's not in the Bible... Where did it come from? Didn't come from the Bible. So where did it come from? I need to know. So tonight, and perhaps it's boring for some, but for others, I, I, I want to give you a little history lesson on a little church history, and I'm going to bring it, condense it way down. If it interests you, you can read some great history uh, books about church history. Uh, but after the death, of res, uh, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he ascends into heaven. After his ascension into heaven, we begin what is called the apostolic age. This is when the apostles go throughout the world, and they begin to preach the gospel. They begin to tell of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, Andrew goes to Greece. John is in, on an island, also a Grecian island. Thomas goes to India. We know that Matthew ends up going to Ethiopia and so forth, and you can find out where all they go. And it's led by these apostles. And they preach Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. They preach that you had to be born again of water and spirit. That you would speak in tongues is the evidence of, speak, of receiving the spirit. That they preach there's one God. And there's no mention in history during this apostolic age of the triune or trinity. After the conclusion of the apostolic age in AD uh, 60, I'm sorry, 90, uh, when John dies, uh, we begin what we call the post-apostolic age. Post-apostolic age goes for 50 years, from 90 to 140 A.D. And this time the church begins to grow, and it's growing even more uh, fervently uh, with pastors and leaders set up all around the then-known world. And Christianity is blossoming in this post-apostolic age. Three important writers write history. These are bishops in different churches around this unified or uh, National or one universal, the word universal is Catholic, so we're not talking Roman Catholic, but the universal, the Catholic of us, the United Church, uh, Clement, Ignatius, and Polycarp. And in their writings, they record of this post apostolic age that is filled with uh, one God, Jesus' name, church, people who are being baptized in the name of Jesus. Holiness is, is written extensively, uh, forbidding. Uh, men to have long flowing hair women were to have long uncut hair and the painting of the face and was forbidden by women and, 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 and men alike and gifts of the spirit you can go on and on you can read a lot about this post apostolic age, but there's not one mention of the word trinity not one mention we are 140 years now past Christ's ascension and we are in the end and the conclusion of the post apostolic age and we go into the next age at 140 A.D which will last for about 50 years, so I'm sorry, 130 A.D., 50 years to 180 A.D., known as the Greek apologist. This is the time of the Greek apologist. Now the language of the world then, the, the commerce language, the business was done in was in the Greek language. So Greek at that time would have been like English at this time. If you wanted to do business, uh, you had to know Greek. Now it might, have, it might, might be uh, uh, Chinese in a few uh, years if we keep going down this road, but... At that time, it was Greek, and so the intellectual uh, writers of the church history, uh, they begin to write using the Greek, Greek language. The church has been persecuted. It is under severe persecution because to be a Christian in these ages was illegal. It was not legalized until 313 years after 
the Christ, Jesus Christ. And so the first 60 years, the church had faced severe persecution from the Jewish people, the Jews, Jewish religion, and now the pagans are, are persecuting them. And these Greek apologists, they begin to write in defense of Christianity. While it was illegal, they would write with philosophical ideas to convert people to Christianity. They could not use scripture to validate their points because it was illegal and because scripture was forbidden by law. And so they presented Christianity as the best moral, philosophical solution of the age. And they did an extraordinary job in converting many people using the strategy from a philosophical standpoint that Christianity at its base is the best way to live. And I'm going to tell you that's the truth. That you take away all other aspects, even the, the eternal reward, and I don't like doing that, but for the sake of the, the, the lesson tonight, take away the eternal reward, and philosophically, the ideology, our, our method and style of life is the best. One wife, come on, it's the best life. And, uh, and so they make a, an incredible point in case, and in so doing, they start converting people. The only problem is, is that now they're converting people to philosophy and not experience. And so they are, they are philosophically converted, but in an attempt to do that without using scripture to make their case greater in this age of Greek apologies, apologists, they start mixing in, because it fits so great, some Greek philosophy. So there's the merging now of, of man's philosophy or Greek philosophy with Christian philosophy. This is setting the stage for big problems, very big problems. And so as we move through time on this history lesson, we're going very quickly tonight. We've, we've come through the apostolic age, the post-apostolic age, the Greek apologist. And they, at the conclusion of the Greek apologist age is the old Catholic age. Catholic, of course, just being, meaning universal. We're not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. And now, even in this time, in this age, we're at 170 years after Christ. The church is united. They're still uh, as one... It, believing that there is one God. And even in the Greek time of Greek apologists, there's no mention of a triune, there's no mention of a trinity, there's no mention of eternal sonship, there's no mention of any of these, these concepts that have been taught and made up by men and that will happen in the coming age and their universe. Now there are, there are some heresies that slip in in these, these, these post-apostolic age and Greek uh, apologist age. They slip in four main ones and you can study that out as you want. And so because of the heresies that are coming in and they're slipping and pulling people out of the church, um, the, this, this next age, the age of the old Catholic age, as we call it, uh, it, introduces us to theologians, people that, men that give themselves to countering and writing against the heresies of the day. And they would write uh, against uh, Gnosticism and, and, and all of these different things. And, and in so doing, they would base some of their writings upon the scriptures, but they would use also the age before them, the time of the Greek apologists. And that introduces us to a theologian by the name of Tertullian. Tertullian was one of the most well-known uh, theologians in the old Catholic age. He is the man who had, he had really, if you study Tertullian, he had some really good beliefs that he had about him, but very, very conservative. He was actually uh, removed and kicked out of the uh, church uh, for some of his doctrines, but the one that he introduces to the church is the doctrine of the Trinity. So the first mention of the word Trinity took place at around 195 or about, I should say, 213, because he converted about 195. He was from northern Africa. And he, he began, he was, a, he was a lawyer and a teacher. He was extremely intelligent. And he begins to write. And in this attempt to describe and explain the deity of Christ, he, he uses uh, Greek apologists. So he is, he is basing a lot of his doctrinal philosophies upon what he had received from previous eras, uh, and he, he reflects back to the philosophies of man instead of the word of God. And that is really where the root of the problem lies. The teaching of the Trinity is deeply ingrained into Greek philosophy 
It has nothing to do with Bible theory or any kind of study of Scripture. So to, he begins to uh, refer to God in the form of three persons. Now, the Trinity, if you read the Trinity and you study it out, this is, I'm teaching, this is history. You can look it up in a history book. This ain't the UPC manual. <laughs> Uh, if you look at Tertullian's writings about uh, the Trinity, it, it, it's a little different than modern Trinitarian doctrine because the Trinity has evolved, can I say. It is not as it was original, and that should make you scared. That should prove to you even further that it is an erroneous doctrine in that the fact that its original creator did not teach what they teach even now. But he does introduce the concept of there being three distinct persons that make up God. He writes in his writings, you'll read, he says, My, uh, the doctrine of a triune being, God, was, is rejected by most Christians. They firmly believe in one God. He says, but they are, it is because they are small-minded, unwise, unlearned, and simple. <laughs> it's kind of what they called the apostles. They perceived them to be unlearned and ignorant men. And he had this elitist, I am smarter you. And I'm going to tell you, that spirit still is really entwined into those that have been laid trap to the doctrine of the Trinity. So you don't, not, you don't want to go into a doctrinal debate with a Trinitarian because there is a spirit of pride that is deeply ingrained with it. What you need to do is go right to the new birth. Tonight I'm teaching people that know there is one God. But I'm helping you read your Bible because of previous habits that you were taught that were wrong. Amen? Amen. And so uh, uh, he, he was the first to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He would actually baptize them three times. In the name of the Father, one. In the name of the Son, two. In the name of the... Uh, three. Three times. Nowhere in your Bible does it say to do it like that. They were not to bathe the first week after baptism. You're welcome. <laughs> we encourage you to take a bath. Coming out of that water with all those sins left over. You got to take a bath. And then time ticks on from uh, 357 to 787, uh, the ecumenical the Catholic uh, Church or the universal church. The church still has not been divided. There's no denominations or major uh, positions that have taken that are really contrary to Scripture. But there are these segments and these conversations that are taking place. And uh, uh, around 312 A.D., uh, the emperor's name of Rome is uh, Constantine. Up until Constantine, depending on who the Roman ruler was, the Christians would be persecuted at extremely horrific levels. This is the time where you see them being burned at the stake. And uh, they uh, were just horrible, horrible ways they were treated. But Constantine is the really consummate politician. He is a politician deluxe. And so according to him, he has this vision of a cross. And, and he says, God, if I get the victory, then it's you. And and if I, then you're real and he goes into war slaughters a bunch of people and because of this great slaughter victory he says well I'm a Christian now he's never baptized until his deathbed he does not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost he doesn't repent of his sins he continues to slaughter he kills his second wife uh, but he's a Christian he's a good old Christian you know love those kind you know um, and he gets together and at uh, uh, one year later, thir 313 A.D., at the Edict of Milan in Milan, Italy, they uh, legalize Christianity. It is here uh, that Christianity now becomes mainstream because Constantine realizes that paganism is on the decline and Christianity is on the uptick. And he says, if I can take control of Christianity, I can control my empire and be empowered. And so that's exactly, exactly what he does. And at 325 uh, A.D., so Constantine's rule is going well. He's a Christian. Uh, things are well. But there's a major schism, a major division that's taking place now in the church. And it is about the identity of who Christ is. And Constantine, being a political savvy, just a genius, he senses the disunity, and he says, I have got a problem on my hand. I need to bring some unity into this church, so I will call together a meeting. And this is the first ever council of, uh, of church 
fathers or church deacons and bishops, and he calls them, he pays their expenses to a place called Nicaea. And in 325, he presides over a council by the name of the Council of Nicaea, where they will discuss and determine whether the doctrine of the Trinity is to be used or the doctrine of uh, monotheism, one God, is to be uh, utilized. And, and so they get together. This is the first time in the history of the church that a church board meeting is, being taken, is taking place with a politician running it. Now listen, how do you feel if Eastgate, if I said, we've got to have a board meeting, so I'm going to call, uh, I'm going to call Joe Biden. <laughs> Joe Biden will be making the decisions for Eastgate Church from now on. I mean, we love our mayor, but Mayor Misty, we don't need her making decisions about what happens because she's not even one of us yet. Yeah. Joe Biden's not one of us yet either. He's got a long ways to go. And he sure doesn't need to be a part of the church. Much less chairing the meeting. Chairing the meeting. This is the merger. This is where we find the beginning of church and state coming together. And, and so they, they do not make a, a fixed uh, statement here. But they lean towards uh, Tertullian's teachings of the Trinity. 50 years or so later, uh, around 380 B, uh, AD, they're at the Council of Constantinople. It has reached a feverish pitch. They are such a, a division that Constantine, once again, they calls them together, and they decide that the Trinity uh, will become the doctrine that they teach. He, he, he demands that every bishop, every, every church leader in the meeting sign. If they do not sign an agreement, then they will be... Uh, excommunicated and uh, imprisoned, all but two sign uh, just for fear primarily of their lives. This is where at the, at the Council of Constantinople here, the, the, the laws of the church now became the laws of the land. This is a dangerous place to be in. This is now, he said, not only will you be a Christian, if you're going to be a Christian, you're going to believe in three gods. And if you teach that there's one God, you will be killed. That's what happens when you get government involved in the church. Come on. Okay. And, and so uh, the decision to adopt this teaching that was made up by a man by the name of Tertullian was adopted by a politician in Rome. Not out of prayer. Not out of fasting. Not out of study of scripture. It was the result of man mixing philosophy with Bible ideas. Colossians chapter 2 and 8 says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Let me just remind us, Eastgate Church, that what we lean to are not the philosophical ideas. It's, you better be careful. One of the most dangerous things you can get out there to study is philosophy. Come on. And get philosophical ideas because there's some things that philosophically do not and will never align for they require faith. They're going to require you to take this word and say, man, that doesn't make sense. I, can't I just can't figure it out. You will never. There are some things you've got to say, I live by faith. Come on. It's when you start trying to mix and you try to, well, I think, I didn't come to hear what you thought. We're here to, what does God have to say? What does this book say? Amen? And that's why we do not put our, uh, when you are a part of an Eastgate church and you come here and you hear preaching, you never hear the preacher. And you will never hear the preacher say, well, according to the teachings of, of Constantine or according to the teachings of Calvin or according to the teachings of, of, of whatever church father, or, and we don't reference the, 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 the fathers that are other than the apostles. We don't call on a creed that was made up by a council of men uh, outside of the scripture so, because we are part of what I like to call the modern apostolic age. I said we are part of the modern. The only difference in the modern apostolic age and the apostolic age is we use microphones. 
and air conditioning and we have padded pews but we are the continuation of the apostolic post apostolic modern apostolic we are not leaning to Greek apologetics we're not leading to modern come on well this this philo philosophical guy says this philo who cares who cares who cares so you you got to be careful there amen and so we base our teachings 100 percent upon the scriptures upon the scriptures and uh and so as we look at the study and the understanding of the the, the doctrine of the trinity the the modern teaching of it is uh man did y'all cut my time short or am i just having a lot of fun Give me a few more minutes. I gotta take, I'll take ten. We're, we're, we'll we'll get into it. Uh, we'll look into it a little bit, and I can finish next week if need be. But the modern teaching and what it has evolved into now, uh, most people that believe in the Trinity cannot explain it. Matter of fact, they will even the great, the greatest theologians within the Trinitarian movement will say these words. I, I wrote it down. The Trinity is a mystery that cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is understood by faith. That's what they say. For they teach that there are three separate persons in the Godhead, that these three separate persons are co-equal, co-eternal, co-essential. So there's three people that make up one God. And you can't know it. There's no way. There's no way. You just got to. There's just. You just got to believe me. Matthew 16 and 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, "Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am?" You cannot know this. You just got to believe it by faith. That, that he's not asking a question that he doesn't want you to know the answer to. The identity of who Jesus Christ is is not something that's relegated to some people that are really, 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 really smart up in some hocus-pocus place and all the smart people get to know and us, the dumb people, don't get to know. That is not true. He looked at a fisherman and said, who am I? Don't you let some arrogant, well, he's a doctor of this and he's a theologian of that, convince you that he somehow has some greater access to the throne of God. You can know who he is. You can know who Jesus is. And it is the greatest thing you will ever know. It is the thing men laid their lives down. We're burned at the stake. We're dipped in, in, in wax and then lit on fire as torches to light the gardens of Nero. It is that that you know and believe and it matters. It matters. Then some say, some say you're John. Some say you're, 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 you're so and so and Elias and Jeremiah. He said, but who do you say that I am? Simon said, I know who you are. You're the son of the living God. That's right. You said it. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. But my Father which is in heaven, and I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Paul said it to Timothy, and without controversy. Without controversy. That means no debate. This isn't hard to understand. Oh, it's hard to understand. You just gotta, you just, you know, if you go to school for about 3,700 years, and you just, ex just accept it by faith without controversy. You can know the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels and preached into the Gentiles, believed on in the world and received up into glory. Well, they're co-equal. How can they be co-equal? Okay. It's, it, that means that, 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 that there's, they're sitting up there and that, that me and Duke are, we're just, you know, we, we're, we're the same. Okay, well, if we're the same, Isaiah 45 and 6 says that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. And I can go into that over and over and over. There is no one equal to God. There's one God. He has no equal. Amen. You do, so do you not believe in a Father, Son, and Spirit? They say, well, of course we do. We believe in the Father. We believe in the Son. We believe that He is the Father in creation. We know He's the Son in redemption. And we know He's the Spirit in regeneration. But these three are one, not three persons that share a common will. Or a, and, and most the, uh, uh, Trinitarians don't believe they have separate wills. Okay? 
not three persons. There's not three persons. There's in heaven, John, uh, Revelation 4 and 1. How many are in heaven? Ask, ask your good Trinitarian friend. How many are there in heaven? After this I looked, and behold, a door was open. Where was the door? In heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were trumpet talking with me which saith come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter and immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and set thereon okay so a common question and we get that and I'm, I'm taking some because I promised you I would answer them as you they came in well why did Jesus pray in the garden of Gethsemane okay if there's, if there's one God and, and Jesus is God why is he praying in the garden of Gethsemane the question is not for me to answer the question would be for the Trinitarian for if they are co-equal why would one have to ask the other permission and why would one have to submit to the other because they don't have to submit to either because they're all equal so really the question's not mine I want to ask you the question why did they pray because to us, it's, pretty, it's a very, very simple answer. We understand that the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ was the Son. As you read your Bible, have you ever read the Son of Man hath no place to lay his head? You ever read that Bible? The Son of Man. So in Scripture, Jesus is referred to as the Son of Man. But he's also referred to as the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. And he's the Son of God. The theological uh, saying or phrase for this is called dual nature of Christ. That Christ is both man and God. Does that make sense? God forgives sins. That's why Jesus could say your sins are forgiven. And he ticks everybody off, right? Who is this that forgiveth sin? Who can forgive sins but God? Am I right? That's why Jesus could say to the storm, be still. Wow, even the waves and the wind listened to him. Why? How did he do that? He was God. Am I right? So God is Jesus because he's forgiving sins. But does God get hungry? No, God doesn't get hungry. Does God get sleepy? He neither, he, neither, he neither sleeps nor slumbers, the Bible says. Come on. But Jesus got hungry and thirsty and tired and weary. For Jesus was as much a man as he was God. Take your index finger and your thumb and pinch them together. Now take the back of your hand and put skin from your index and your uh, thumb and squeeze as hard as you possibly can. Does that hurt? If Jesus was in the building, it would have hurt him too. He was a man. As, you, as I am a man, he is a man. And Jesus was a man. And the man, Christ Jesus, the flesh, did not want to die. He's got it going on. He got 12 friends. He's turning water into wine. Come on, he's having a, things are going good. And so the man, who is also the example, a man has to pray. He has to uh, get down and, uh, as an example, pray, but also as a man. And what he's teaching us is, what he's teaching us, there's a trial I'm going to go through that I do not want to go through, and the only way I'm going to get through it is prayer. So the man, Christ Jesus, knew this is the only way that I get through it is on my knees in prayer. It doesn't mean that there's God one talking to God two. I'm sorry, God two talking to God one. For there are not three gods. There are not multiple persons. Our God is not a God of a personality disorder. He is singular. God, one God, one God, one God, one God. So it says that they, so he's not co-equal uh, and he's definitely uh, not co-eternal and there's not different persons of, of, the, of the Trinity. I, as a matter of fact, Isaiah, here's what Isaiah 9 and 6 says. This is very familiar. I want us to read it. Isaiah 9 and 6, you know it if you've, if you've ever had a Christmas card from a Christian. Why don't you read it out loud together with me? What kind of father is he? Okay. For unto us a son is born. This is Jesus. Look at your neighbor say, this is Jesus. There is only one time in your Bible that God is called everlasting father. Only one time is the word everlasting next to the word father. 
and that's in Isaiah chapter 9 and 6. The only time the word everlasting father is used, it's not even in reference to the father first person in the Trinity. It's in reference to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the everlasting father. Does that make sense? Jesus Christ is the everlasting father. Okay? They are not they are they are not two co-eternal persons. Uh, Jesus is the everlasting father in flesh. Does that make sense? That's why in John 14 and we'll take time to read verse 3 uh, down to quite a bit. And if I go and prepare, he's speaking to his disciples about uh, his departure. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, he doesn't say where we are, that where I am, not we, okay, there ye may be also. And whether I go, you know, in the way you know, Thomas said to them, uh, where, where are you going? And how can we know the way? Verse 6, Jesus said to him, we are the way. No, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father but by the only way you're ever going to access the invisible Spirit of God is through the visible man, Christ Jesus. That's what he's saying, okay? If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father. And from henceforth, that means right now, you know, know who do you know? The Father. And have seen who? Who's he talking about? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about the Father? If you had known, come on, let's go back to verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you know my Father. Okay, if you've never met Mike Tuttle and you meet me, come on, and I say, hey, you've met me, you know the Father. Now hold on. If you've never met my dad, and I'm like, so what is my dad? What does the father look like? Tall. No, he's short. <laughs> you think he's balding too? Probably. Don't ever tell him he's balding because he got like the, it's the thing he's most proud of. This gorgeous, you see, is the mane he lets it. I'm like, dad, you got to cut it. <laughs> but you do know the father because I am a father. And if you know me, you know the Father. If you've seen me, matter of fact, if you've seen me, this is the only way you're ever going to see the Father because the Father is a spirit and the Father cannot be seen. The only access to the invisible Father, Spirit, Jehovah, Holy One, the I Am, the Lily of the Valley, the bright morning star, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, is when you're looking at him right here. Look at me, baby. This is it. You've seen me. Philip still confused. He says, show us the Father. It's enough. Jesus is like, oh my goodness, how long have I been with you? You're still saying, show me the Father. Believest thou not that I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me. And the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father, the invisible, that dwelleth. Believe ye that I'm in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the, the very work's sake. Look at what I'm doing, dude. And I will pray the Father, that he shall give you another comforter. This doesn't mean a third God. That he, the comforter, may abide with you forever. So now he's talking about the Holy Ghost. Okay? Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. Who are we talking about? Holy Ghost. You know the Holy Ghost. The world hasn't seen it yet. They can't understand it yet because they haven't seen it. But, but you know him. Here's why. For he dwelleth. Woo, where's he dwelling? With you. That means it's me, Jesus. And shall be. I will not leave you comfortless. Who's coming? Who's coming? I will come again. That makes sense. I'm going to, he said, I'm not going to leave you comfort. There's another one coming. He says, it's, you're, they're not going to know who it is, but you're going to know because I'm with you right now. But I'm not going to just be with you on the outside. When I come back in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, I will come back as a spirit, the spirit. And I'm not just going to be, ooh, I'm not going to be hanging out with you. I'm going to put myself in you. 
Are you telling me I have to have the Holy Ghost? Are you a moron? Why wouldn't you want to have Christ in you? The dude that raised the dead and healed the lame and walked on the water. Why wouldn't you want to have the Holy Ghost Christ in me, the hope of glory? (laughs) I need it, I want it, I love it, it's great. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me because I live. You shall live also. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father and ye in me and I in you. I in you. I, the flesh, am leaving, but I, the Spirit, am returning. And the Spirit that returns, that fills you, we will call it the Holy Spirit. It's Christ in you. It will regenerate you. It will, it will sanctify you. It'll lead you into all truth. It'll give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. It'll give you, oh, you'll speak with other tongues. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. I'm with you. Amen. Someone said, well, 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 why was Jesus baptized? And when he was baptized, this is a common question. Why? What about the voice? Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. And there's a voice that says, behold, my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased in the dove descends. There you go. Bam. There he is. There's three. These are not three different persons of God. These are three different manifestations of God. So we understand that God is the omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. Spirit. Look at your neighbor and say, God is everywhere. God is everywhere. That's kind of scary. Amen. We was on vacation. I tell the kids, God's here with us on vacation. I got to remind y'all, God goes with you to the beach. He goes with you to the slitter bonds and the movie houses and God's everywhere. Come on, somebody. Mm-hmm. He's everywhere. And God can manifest himself in any capacity, way, shape, or form that he so desires. At this moment in time, God can manifest himself as a stunningly handsome six foot five, partially balding man before you. <laughs> I'm not saying that. I just. He could show up right here as a dove. He could show up in Amsterdam as a, as a little monkey. He could go over. He can manifest himself at a thousand places at the same exact time. Does that mean we're going to say that there's God the dove? Is there God the lily of the valley? Is there God the rose of Sharon? Is there God the every, every manifestation is not a God. It's a manifestation of the singular God. We don't deify the manifestations. There's only one that's deified, and that is the spirit of God. Amen. Does that make sense? Incredible. So there's one God who manifests himself three ways. And so we see this co uh, eternal idea of I'm sorry this uh, yeah this co-eternal idea of Jesus Christ is also not true and I'm going to grab that very quickly for the sake of time uh, for the Trinitarian doctrine teaches that Christ was eternal okay this this is not true John chapter 3 verse 16 it's their favorite verse let's use it for God so loved the world that he his what his what son which son what kind of son was he what not eternal if something is born it begins Does that make sense? Jesus is the begotten son, not the eternal son. Okay, so eternal sonship is not true. You guys saw me. I Googled it in the the whole, searched the whole Bible in 10 seconds. Eternal sonship is not in the Bible, but begotten son is in the Bible. Does that make sense? Okay, amen. And I could go John 3, 18. Let's read it for fun. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God okay so well what about I'm going quickly through these questions and then we can be done what about when the Bible says God and the Father Colossians 1 and 3 we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ praying always for you okay and whatsoever 3 and 17 whatsoever you do in word and deed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ giving thanks to God and the Father this can be confusing can anybody just be honest and say yeah sometimes I read that and that's kind of confusing yeah yeah the reason it's confusing is because we've been raised in, 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 in an idea of Trinity. But, but it, Philip was also a little confused about it. He's like, hey, just show us the Father and it's enough. And he's sitting with Jesus. So don't beat yourself up too bad. Amen. Okay. Um, and so he, he says, I give thanks to God and the Father. Well, look right there. God and the Father. But the question then goes back to the Trinitarian. First, if there's three, 
God and the Father. Boy, he forgot himself. I'm not, I'm not trying to make fun, but if there's a true we in heaven and he's going to give thanks, he forgot to give thanks. And he forgot to give thanks to 2 Peter 1 and 21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time, but the will of men by holy men of God spake as they were moved by the what? The Holy Ghost is inspiring men as they write this Bible. Do you believe that? So the Bible says. The, it's Holy Ghost inspired. The Holy Ghost just forgot himself. Okay, but, keep, but look at 2 Timothy 3 and 16. For Paul says here that all scripture is given by inspiration of Inspi they were moved by the Holy Ghost all scripture is inspiration of God do you see it right there Holy Ghost, God one and the same ladies and gentlemen there's only one that's holy and there's only one spirit you call it a Holy Spirit that's God, amen Okay, God and the Father the word and here is Kai it's Kai and it is, it means even or also so it does, it does not mean another it's, it's not saying Matthew and Pat it's saying Pat even so it could also have been translated even so Pat even father even man with cool glasses even son right so there's it's just it's stating I think God even or also and does that make sense the father it's not saying there's two of them it's just saying that he's the visible and the invisible he's the flesh and the spirit it's just giving thanks to them both, okay? Does that make sense? The, the, the Trinity concludes with Christ, Jesus Christ being, not concludes, teaches that Christ is the second person in the Godhead. Colossians 2 and 9, as I start winding down, for in him dwelleth all. This is Christ Jesus. For in him, Jesus, dwelleth who? The what? Of the? Now, if you are talking, and, and again, I'm not encouraging you to go out and start debating I don't do it but if you are debating or you're talking to somebody and they're struggling uh, to understand and they're truly truly hungering for truth you can just ask them is Jesus in the Godhead or is the Godhead in Jesus and uh, if they are Trinitarian they would have to say that Jesus Christ is in the Godhead then you take them to Colossians chapter 2 and 9 and you say oh I'm so sorry but the Bible says that the fullness of the Godhead is in Christ Jesus bodily amen amen Hero Israel, I, I want us to go to Deuteronomy 6 and 4. I'm on the final page. Deuteronomy 6 and 4, and I want us to read it together out loud, and we're going to read all of it. Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk on them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and thou shalt be as frontlets between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thee thy my fathers uh, to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob uh, to give thee great and God goodly cities uh, which thou buildest not and that house is full of good things uh, which thou f findest not uh, wells that you didn't dig uh, which thou diggest not I'm sorry vineyards and olive trees uh, which thou plantest not when thou shalt have eaten and be full then beware lest thou forget the Lord Adonai God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his the Lord thy God his singular name ye shall not go after other Deuteronomy 6 4 10 verses later he warns us he says love this one God message he says, you got to tell it to your kids every day. You got to tell it to yourself every day. There's one God, and his name is Jesus. And yet, every day, there's one God. He says, beware, lest you get to the place where you start believing there's multiples. There's only one God. There's only one God. There's only one God. As you stand, I said, therefore, unto you, John 8 and 24, I use it often. This is Jesus. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins for if you believe not 
that I am he. Ye shall die in your sins. 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. He said, I am the I am. And if you don't believe that I am who I say I am, and you change who I am, you'll die in your sins. You telling me I'm going to go to hell? 59, next verse. They took up stones. They got angry about this message. They got ugly about the Jesus name message. And I'm going to tell you, people, what's going to separate us in this last day is the Jesus name message. What I'm teaching you here tonight will one day be called heresy but after the way they called heresy I want you to know that the day will come that what we are saying here cannot be said publicly there will be an ecumenical church that will rally around and it will be nothing like what I'm teaching you here today you better get this in your heart you better get this in your soul you better get it in your kids I said you better get this in your kids well I came to church and I need to feel good no you need to hear one God you need to get it in your heart get it in your crawl get it in your soul you need to get it past your mind and you need to get it into your heart for they had not a love for the truth baby I don't just know the oneness of God I love the oneness of God I've constructed, built and founded well, teach us about the end times. Tell us about the gifts of the Spirit. I may not be an articulate eschatologist, and I may not be able to articulate the gifts of the Spirit, but I can tell you one thing. There's one God, and, and His name is Jesus. And whatever you need, it's in the name of Jesus. Dim the lights. I did a final search in my little Bible. I, I want to use all my videos' talents on one night. I missed two Wednesday nights. So I, I kept going. I said, God is three. It's zero times in your Bible. Three gods. Yeah, it's not in there. Then I type one God. <sighs> 337 times. <laughs> God is one let's see let's see what do you think 207 times hear Israel the Lord our God is one one Lord one faith you can turn those lights back on one baptism one God and Father who is above all who is through all and who is in you all and I'm glad I know him I said I'm glad I know him I'm glad it's not just theology or philosophy I'm glad it's experience come on I said I'm glad it's experience and if you've never experienced the comforter if you've never had Jesus come into you that one God, that water walker, come on, that sin forgiver, he'll come into your life and change your life and you can walk out of this house saying, I know who he is. He's in me. I was talking to a young lady that I baptized a few weeks ago and she drives all the way from the woodlands to come to church. And this last Sunday, she drove from the woodlands to Huntington to get her mother Woodlands to Huntington what's that about an hour from Huntington to here what's that two hours she drove three hours to get here to church it was here on time that's a whole nother sermon <laughs> her mama got the Holy Ghost and we baptized her she said pastor I need a, I need a Bible study because I'm, I'm going to bring everybody she said Next Sunday, I'm bringing my aunt. She said, but I've been telling my aunt about this Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. And she's telling me that it's not real. She said, Pastor, she's Southern Baptist, and she knows a lot. And I don't know anything. She said, so we're in the bookstore. She said, I just looked at her and said, Auntie, I know it's real. I did it. (laughs) You, be, you, you smart and you got your brains but I spoke in tongues when the Holy Ghost came it's real it's real I know 
that it's real. This Pentecostal blessing, and I know, I know it's real. Throw your hands up before we leave. Father, I thank you for the revelation of the oneness of God. I thank you that I know that you're one. I thank you, Father, that, Lord, we can walk into this house without fear of persecution from government, Lord, from any other man, and we can declare the oneness of God. I speak, Lord, to those perhaps struggling with the identity of Christ, that they would take their, your word and they would begin to read your word, that they would read it with fervency, not turning to the creeds and counsels of, of, of men before, but turning only to the word of the Lord. And in that, they would find you to be the mighty God in Christ. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. If you hate the devil, clap your hands real loud. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I love you guys. Y'all are the best. Shake somebody's hand. Get your kids. I know I went into overtime. Amen. Uh, grab them quickly. And I will see you here Sunday morning.